Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's online event at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Bernice Yearn, Managing Editor of the Investigative Reporting Program at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Journalism. I'm also the author of In a Day's Work, The Fight to End Sexual Violence Against America's Most Vulnerable Workers. The pandemic put into stark relief the undue burden faced by working poor women in America. Many were laid off or had to quit for COVID-related reasons, like school closures. They often struggled in low-wage jobs as essential workers while facing greater demands at home. But even in the best of times, women in low-wage industries must cope with daunting challenges. In their new book, Getting Me Cheap, sociologists Lisa Dodson and Amanda Freeman argue that the conveniences many Americans enjoy, things such as grocery delivery and nanny care, are made possible by the sacrifices of these women. The book reveals how discrimination, unpredictable work schedules, and a lack of affordable childcare trap women in poverty and make work-life balance impossible. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Lisa Dodson, Research Professor Emerita, Boston College, and co-author of Getting Me Cheap, How Low-Wage Work Traps Women and Girls in Poverty. Amanda Freeman, Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Hartford and co-author of Getting Me Cheap. And Saru Jayaraman, President of One Fair Wage and Director of the Food Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. Thank you for joining us. And if you're watching along with us, please put your questions or comments in the text chat on YouTube and we'll get to them later on in the program. So let's start with Amanda and Lisa. Amanda and Lisa, tell me a little bit about what inspired the both of you to write this book and how did you go about gathering the stories that became the heart and soul of this book? Sorry, I was about to start talking without unmuting, which is never <laughs> a good idea. Um, so I met Lisa when I was a graduate student at Boston College. Um, we both actually have a shared history of single parenthood. Um, and so I kind of came to being a graduate student interested in this concept of work-family conflict um, and sort of through that journey, really realizing how centered on affluent, you know, professional mothers that literature and that conversation was, um, doing interviews connected with community organizations, with Lisa, um, we really uncovered these different issues that low-income moms were experiencing. I don't know if you if you want to say anything about that, Lisa. Yeah, I mean, I think we were very much in doing the research we did for this book and all of our work, um, really making contact with and working alongside community-based and national organizations who really drew us in and allowed us to have these conversations. What did those conversations look like? I, I understand you spoke with hundreds of women. How did you get them to share their stories with you? Yeah. Do you, I, I was just going to say, people tend to think that it's it's really difficult. I find especially, you know, busy moms, you give them time and space to tell their stories and they really open up. Um, sometimes, you know, they, they don't have a lot of people asking them about their struggles, about their kids, about their jobs. Um so we, we did a lot of kind of meeting them where it was helpful for them, like playgrounds, community centers, their apartments, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said, you know, working with some organizations that provide services to low income women or are unions that work with low wage workers, um, they really wanted to hear some of the accounts we were gathering and and wanted us, you know, connected us with people you know, I think it was really important to build a level of trust with those organizations so that they, in fact, really made it, you know, made it possible for us to meet up. But yeah, Amanda's right. I mean, how often do people get to talk about, particularly low wage workers, get to talk about what day to day life is like? You know, we really wanted to hear. And I think what was really fascinating was how you started the book with some really powerful anecdotes about how girls are affected by low-wage work, um, by the low-wage work of their mothers and their families. Can you tell us a little bit about what your research reveals as it relates to girls and what the longer-term implications are? Yeah. You know, I, I think if we all reflect in our own lives um, as parents or we know parents, um, as grandparents maybe... It, it takes a lot to manage a family in, in this country. It takes a lot. It takes 
a lot of time and it takes a lot of money. Um, and, um, and if you're in a family where there is, where people have, parents have, and, and our work is largely with moms, they have not enough money. They're not paid enough to have money to buy some of the supports that more affluent families use to keep stability, to provide their kids with everything they feel they need. Um, they have to come up with other strategies. And one of those we heard commonly over many years now is asking kids to take on roles in families. Um, and in particular, girls often are called on to provide a lot of care work in their families. Uh, and, and that care work takes different forms. A, a really common story we heard interviewing women, young women, was that when they were quite young, they were doing a lot of care of younger children. And they were helping with cousins and nieces and nephews. Um, and sometimes if parents simply had no money for childcare, that could mean not being able to join extracurricular activities, not being able to join sports, not being able to be involved in what a lot of other, we, we assume children are involved in in their day-to-day -day lives. They were providing hours and hours of care work for their family and sometimes really maintaining the whole home front because parents, low-wage parents, sometimes are working double shifts, sometimes are even chasing jobs that take them out of the, out of the family neighborhood, you know? Um, it's kind of a quiet reality that, that doesn't get, I think, uh, you know, certainly our research suggests it needs a lot more attention. And what girls told us about that is that, or women told us as girls, um, and some of them acknowledge that they rely on their own daughters now too. If you can't buy childcare, and childcare is enormously expensive, then you have to, look, and you have to go to work and you're not paid enough so that you can, in fact, be able to purchase supports that I know I relied on and, and I know a lot of us have relied on that have raised kids, then you sometimes have to, to rely on, um, on other people. And that in, in the case of a lot of, of the women we talked to uh, as, as young girls, they were very much doing what I think we think sort of cultural, the dominant society would say are adult or adult responsibilities and adult work. I do want to add one thing about it, that even though it really diverted girls, I mean, we heard from women who said, you know, they had dreams. One woman wanted to be a marine biologist. One woman wanted to be a child psychologist, particularly working with Asperger. I mean, they had many dreams, but they were not only, they were pulled out sometimes even from school. So there was a lot of sacrifice. There was loss there. But I do want to add that there are a lot of these women said that they were also very strong young people. Uh, they had a lot of sense of self. They had very strong connections in their families with their siblings um, and, and they acknowledged loss, but they also saw themselves as, as people who had a lot of what, you know, we often call agency, um, the capacity to make decisions. And with a, a kind of moral sense that, you know, my, what I'm doing in this world is not only about me, it's also about other people starting with my, my siblings and my family. Yeah. Yeah. That did really strike me that there was a sense of um, value that they recognize in themselves for having assumed this high level of responsibility at such a young age. Um, you know, one story that really jumped out at me, um, especially early on in the book was the story of Lenore from Denver, because I feel like her story helps illustrate just the challenges around the logistics and uh, frankly, the impossibility around the logistics um, in terms of earning minimum wage and trying to raise kids. What kinds of daily calculations was she making? Yeah, well, um, you know, this really gets to the basic math of it. Um, so, you know, our, our national minimum wage, um, actually, when, when Amanda started this book, the national minimum wage was, um, was $7 and 25 cents an hour. You know, that was the, that's the federal minimum wage. And, um, and it continues to be that some 13 years later, after we did all the research and did all the writing it hasn't changed. It was too little then it's much too little now. And Lenore was someone who's her situation really, I think, you know, there were many examples we had, but Lenore uh, was a black mom. We met her in Denver um, and she'd left an abusive situation in another state. Um, she had moved to Denver. She'd moved in with her sister. 
She had two small children, one in grade school and the other was preschool. And what she was trying to do was earn enough money to take care of her family herself. Um, she was also trying to be there for her kids. And what that meant, the way she patched that together was that she had two part-time jobs, one which started early, but she could get up in the morning and take care of her kids, you know, get them ready for school or preschool, and then get back in the afternoon so she could meet them and um, and prepare their, their, help them with homework, do the things we do in the afternoon when little kids come home. And then as soon as they were settled and her sister walked in the door, she ran out to her second job, which is as a security officer, a security person in a building. Um, and that job went till after midnight. Um, she was sleeping from about 1.30 to 6.30 in the morning, about five hours of sleep a night. And she was making on average $10 an hour. She was making $450 a week, uh, managing both those two jobs and trying very hard to be there for her children. And at that time in Denver, calculations had been done about what was the basic family needs for a family with her size, mom with two young kids. And um, she was earning altogether about $25,000 a year. That calculation was that she needed to be earning about $89,000 a year in order to cover everything um, that just basic childcare, rent, food, you know, what we know you need to get by. You know, I want to Add one little thing to that story, um, aside from what Lenore was telling us about how um, how hard it was, how much she worried about her children, trying to make enough money, trying to be there for them. She also was not supposed to be at her, she was not, um, in fact, supposed to be living with her sister because her sister was in a small subsidized apartment, um, partially subsidized. And there's, those are highly regulated. They regulate them very, very carefully. And inviting your sister under any circumstance, if they're two small kids to come live with you, um, was really, was in fact uh, an infraction on the regulations. So on top of worrying about her children, she was also worried about being there and worried about her sister. And she would tell her kids that they had to be very quiet all the time that they needed not to play loud, they needed not to talk loud, that they should really almost practice being invisible little people. And that's a little part of a story that I, you know, those are often are the parts that aren't seen, but I think that it's really profound if we think about our own children or grandchildren or children we've known that to give them that message, you know, and simply because she wasn't paid a fair wage. I was also and just gonna- it. Yeah, oh, sorry. I was just going to say about Lenore's story. I, I feel like it, it's such an illustration of kind of running counter to this narrative that poor women aren't working. I mean, all of the women that we talked to were working, you know, usually multiple jobs, piecing together part time jobs. Um, many of them were working in the night. Lisa and I would say all the time, like, when are they sleeping? Um, yeah. And then also struggling so hard to be good parents. So just the that form of work family conflict for them just being so extreme, I would say. And I was just about to say on that point, one thing that really struck me about Lenore's story and, and having to have her invisibilize children um, was that she had to work extra hard to get their energy out because she knew that, I mean, there were little kids, they had energy and so they, she needed to keep them quiet. And so it was just another layer of work and emotional labor and worry and concern on top of everything else. It was a very powerful anecdote. Um, Saru, Saru, I'd love to turn to you as an expert in um, the food and restaurant industry. Please tell us, how do you see all of, how do you see low wage work impacting girls and women um, in this line of work? Um, well, I think it's uh, first important to understand that girls and women are in this line of work uh, not accidentally, <laughs> um, that this is a very historical, intentional, structural. Uh, in the restaurant industry, waiters were actually men, mostly white men, until emancipation. And at emancipation, the restaurant industry saw an opportunity to get 
free labor. In fact, pre-emancipation, just 10 years before emancipation, those white men went on strike. Demand, they got a full wage and they went on strike for a higher wage in 1853. And the industry started replacing them all with women because they didn't want to pay the men more. And then emancipation happened and they said, oh, we can pay even less. In fact, we can pay nothing and continue slavery. And so they created the system of tips replacing wages rather than tips being on top of wages in order to essentially extend slavery for free black labor to access the free black labor, uh, black female labor. And so since 1865 until this day, low wage restaurant workers have been overwhelmingly women. Tipped workers are over 70% women. They are largely young women. They are but young, you know, I just I just have to say, like, median age is in the mid-30s. So we're not talking about kids. We're not talking about teenagers. We have actually the highest rates of single moms of any occupation in the United States. Um, and they, you know, I remember talking to a reporter at one point and telling her that we've gone from zero dollars at emancipation to two dollars and 13 cents an hour. That's the current federal minimum wage for tipped workers. And it's over 70% women. One in seven American women works in restaurants. She said, you don't have to tell me anything more. That's it. You're done. That the largest employer of women gets to pay $2 an hour is a reflection of America's valuation of women's work, women's work in the United States. By the way, this wasn't always women's work. This work was done by men pre-emancipation. So... Um, so it's very intentional and structural why these low wage sectors are mostly women. It's a devaluation of women and their worth. It's also a devaluation of the work because it's as much, you know, as much as it's women and low wage, and then it's seen as low skill when, you know, in Europe, you go to school for many years to be a hospitality professional. You can become a waiter, a professional waiter, go to Cordon Bleu, you become a professional waiter. But it's just be the way that we pay and treat women in this country that makes these seem as low skill, low wage jobs. So um, pre-pandemic, these jobs were uh, horrific, very hard to survive, you know, all kinds of racial inequity and poverty, uh, racial and gender, you know, sexual harassment, because when you live on tips, you have to put up with so much to get those tips from customers. With the pandemic, it just became unlivable, just completely unlivable. Where women reported tips went way down because sales went down, harassment way up. We already had the highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry. And with the pandemic, we heard from so many women. I'm regularly asked, take off your mask so I can see how cute you are before I decide how much I want to tip you, um, which just completely destroyed the mythology that tipping was ever based on the quality of service in America. No, it's always been based on the gender and race of the server. Um, and so uh, when they were asked to enforce COVID protocols on the very same people from whom they had to get tips to survive, they were done. They were done. And to me, this is the beautiful silver lining. I mean, hopeful doesn't even describe it. <laughs> we are in a historic, I like to say, once in a nation's history moment, uh, which is that for the first time since emancipation, millions of these workers, particularly women, are saying, take your job and shove it. I cannot actually afford to work for these wages. I, I'm not, it's not economically rational to pay more to get to work in gas than I get than I earn when I get there. It, I mean, we want everybody to somehow fit into that economic rationality box of capitalism. They're doing it. They're telling us it's not rational for me to do this. Uh, and so that has resulted in them having the most collective power in our industry that we've seen. It, wages are going way up and we're winning. And um, it's it. I think for this conversation, we should definitely talk about the change and how exciting it is in the historic moment. And we should recognize that it it's just gone on for just way too long. It's so overdue and it's so gendered and so intentional. And it it it's happened. It, we've reached a breaking point where basically women are like, enough is enough. And I definitely want to delve into some of those victories in a little bit, but in the before that, Amanda and Lisa, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, aside from the low pay, what are some of the additional challenges that women in low wage work face when it comes to things like hours and benefits, or really we should say the lack of benefits? 
Right. Um, I, I actually don't think that we, for instance, spoke with anyone who had flex time. Like that came up a lot for parents during the pandemic. Um, I don't think any of our interviewees had that kind of flexibility at work, even though they really are the population that would benefit from it the most, right? Um, they, they don't have access to on-site daycare at work. Um, they didn't, for the most part, have sick leave. I mean, I think there were a few of our interviewees that then had some kind of sick leave, but by and large, they weren't qualifying for sick leave. Some of that can have to do with the piecing together of part-time jobs. We, we certainly um, came across several interviewees who um, either by design or on purpose were, were held below a certain number of hours that would have qualified them for benefits. So they have multiple jobs. They're working, you know, 40 to 60 hours, but they're still not qualifying for for benefits. Um, you know, they might qualify for a child care subsidy, but then they're unable to use that slot or be able to find a daycare that has an open slot to use their child care subsidy. Um, and then, you know, the non-traditional hours versus like when they have responsibilities at their kid's school or to bring kids to medical appointments. Um, so just constantly conflicting, it seems, you know, set up for them to fail both as workers and as parents. You know, um, Saro, a story just came out in the New York Times just yesterday um, that kind of describes some of these um, larger forces at play that have allowed low wage work to maintain in the way that it has maintained. And I'm wondering if you could tell us what's happening behind the scenes. Yeah, and I think it's so relevant to this conversation because we, not we here, but so much of society, press, economists talk about low wage work and, and women in low wage work as if it just sort of happened. <laughs> it just sort of happened. You know, it's just, it's just a result of history, maybe generalized misogyny and sexism. And, and what we've been trying to say for years and the New York Times finally reported on is that no, there have been very, very real protagonists driving this inequality for the last 100 years. And in the case of the National Restaurant Association, doing it with money from those same workers themselves. So look, I'm just going to quickly share this history. Forgive me, but it's just so fascinating. So Look, at emancipation, there were two industries that sought to hire newly freed Black people. One was the restaurant industry. One was the Pullman train company that hired Black men. Uh, as you may all know, Black men in the Pullman train company organized, started to organize in the early 1900s, the first Black union in the United States, and won the right to an actual wage rather than living on tips. Well, observing that in Chicago... A uh, group of restaurant owners said, well, we can't let that happen to the black women that are in the restaurant industry that we've hired for free. So they formed in 1919 in Chicago, watching what was happening with Pullman porters in Chicago, the National Restaurant Association, which we call the other NRA, which for the last 100 years has been lobbying to keep these wages as low as possible. And Bernice, it's not just tipped workers. You know, the National Restaurant Association has been the major force opposing the overall minimum wage going up and paid sick leave and paid family leave and Pregnancy Discrimination Act and health care reform. I mean, they are just the major force fighting every employment condition for all workers, not just restaurant workers. And so they've been doing it since 1919, which is bad enough. But come to find, and we were the ones that gave this info to the New York Times, in the last decade, they have done that in particular by creating a system in which they've gotten bills passed in states like ours in California, requiring workers to all take food safety training, which is a farce. There's you no know, real need for it, in order to force them to pay the National Restaurant Association, which owns the Monopoly Food Safety Training Company. So the workers are compelled to take this training. The money goes to the NRA. Unbeknownst to the workers, their funds are then used to lobby against their own wages. And it's why the federal minimum wage hasn't gone up since 2009. It's because the Restaurant Association's coffers have ballooned to over $80 million a year, coming entirely from low-wage workers and in particularly low wage women. And so it's so evil. It's so nefarious. It's not surprising though. It does take everything we've been talking about to another level because it means not only are there very intentional 
forces, not historical forces, current forces. They're very intentional people and corporations and corporate trade lobbies that are fighting to maintain these low wages and these conditions for women and are doing it uh, on the backs and with the money of low wage workers. When, when forces like that are so entrenched and so huge, how do you even begin as a single mom working at a fast food restaurant begin to fight back? Well, that's what's so exciting. I don't know if you're asking me, but that's what's so exciting about this moment. It is, it is, it's been that hard. It's been that hard because until the pandemic, what these single women working at a fast food restaurant or any restaurant or retail environment have been told by society and these companies and the world is that, yes, this is a job, excuse my language, but what would be even worse is if you were unemployed and you didn't feed your children and you were on welfare, that would be even worse. And so the worst thing in the world for everybody was losing their job. And then March of 2020, it happened. The worst thing they could imagine happened. And they were, they saw that they were still standing. It was horrible. It was horrific. And, but they saw that they were still standing. And particularly, we experienced in the restaurant industry with tipped workers, two thirds of workers telling us, I couldn't get unemployment insurance because in most states, I was told my wages were too low to qualify for benefits. And so if the government is telling me I've earned too little to get the benefits that everybody else who's working as much or less as me is getting, probably I earned too little and I should never have accepted this to begin with. And just so many things happened during, I didn't get unemployment. I went back to work. The tips were horrible. I went back to work. I'm treated like crap. And now I'm asked to do basically become a public health marshal on top of being a, a bartender or a server. Forget it. It doesn't work anymore. And so how, as a low-wage worker, do you, do you, what do you do when you're up against those forces? Turns out you walk away. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that's the answer. I'm just saying what we've seen in the last year is sort of like this massive collective action of workers saying no, walking away. And now our work is to support them to use that power to get bills passed to change it so they can come back. With, with them leading the way. Amanda and Lisa, I know that you spoke to some of, um, you know, the, the women in your book before the pandemic and some after. Were you starting to get that sense that there was um, a desire to push back on the conditions that they were living through as low-wage workers? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I, I think an element that stands out in a lot of the interviews that we've been doing before, during, and after um, is that, is this recognition of that their work is not valued, which, you know, is expressed their wages, absolutely, but also that their children are not valued. I mean, because if you pay people a great deal less than we all know it costs to keep a child safe and to keep a, a family intact, that is, I mean, that is to me, we found, and it also has to do with, we were focusing on mothers um, on, on um, the work family issues, but we found more and more expressions of this is how the society, it's an anti-child society or it's an anti-low income child society and it's an anti-mother society. I mean, that that is a feeling that we got more and more. And I think really reflecting some of Saru's comments, you know, that th this, that, <laughs> you know, people push against that. That is not, you know, being devalued your own work, but having your children be seen as so unimportant. There's a real source of, of uh, you know, people are prepared to push back and they're prepared to also, you know, link arms with others. I was actually just going to add um, that even pre-pandemic, we really found women, I mean, if, if they felt like their, their children were marginalized at work, they would leave the job. You know, they, they had a sense of and I think especially like as multi, having multiple part time jobs, um, you know, motherhood was the most important for them. And if they were having to, to leave work because their children were having an issue at school or they were ill um, and then their boss was going to fire them because of that. So be it. It's not that big of a deal. I'll go get another job. Um, I mean, in, in many ways, that's destructive. Right. It, it gets them into a destructive cycle. They're not able to move up at work. Um, but for the women, they were very clear about my priority is my child. Um, 
And my priority is not going to be this crappy job. I was completely struck by the theme of motherhood throughout your book um, and how it affects the decisions and opportunities that the women have. Um, what kind of childcare was available and you know, how were they able to cobble, to cobble together alternative solutions when the childcare just didn't materialize? Yeah, we saw a lot of um, moms really feeling like they were forced to leave their kids in potentially unsafe situations. And and when that would come up, I mean, depending also on the age of the child is another case in which, you know, moms would leave jobs. Like there's a story um, of one mom who had been waiting to get into an apprenticeship program, you know, which can be a great route other than college education to you know, gain skill and move up and out. Um, so she had actually moved for it, had a child care subsidy, was unable to use her child care subsidy because she couldn't find a spot um, in the city where she had moved. And so she wound up having to go on Craigslist, find an arrangement. You know, a lot of the apprenticeship programs start very early in the morning. Um, so someone was going to have to have, I think, the child in her home and then bring the child to the bus and then take the child off of the bus. And, you know, she said in the interview, she was really uncomfortable with the situation, but it felt like the only way that she could, you know, keep this opportunity. And, and when it fell through and the person didn't show up to pick up her son at the bus, she just left the apprenticeship program because, you know, her, her kid is her priority. So I, we saw that again and again, you know, real concerns about safety, um, real concerns about the childcare that was available to them, and then just kind of circling back to this is what's important. And I think building on that, I mean, um, when there's a situation in which a child is found standing at a, you know, a bus stop or, or, or waiting for mom to come and mom isn't there, the response, you know, the, the, the sort of society's response isn't saying, well, how can we help the situation? You know, if she's making 50% less than she needs um, at her wages, even though she's working, doing the jobs of the nation, you know, um, how can we subsidize this? How can we? No, the response is that mom is a bad mom. The response is, you know, that child protective services files on her. And that's a very powerful weapon in women's lives, low income women's lives, you know, really acknowledging all the fragile ways and, and, you know, all the ways they attempt to keep their kids safe, which fall through at times, you know, or self-care. They leave children alone. They leave a 10 year old taking care of a four year old because they have a forced second shift that day. They don't, th this is information that's kept very private because the person who gets filed on the person who gets blamed is the mom. You know, we don't turn it around and say, well, wait a minute. Why is this the situation of millions and millions of families? Hmm. Yeah, very, it was very, it was very jarring how much um, the women internalized the lack of infrastructure as their own failing um, in, from the accounts in your book. Um, Saru, um, you know, we've been talking about these impossible circumstances that mothers earning minimum wage face, um, but you've also been talking about this powerful kind of uprising and pushback. Tell us about some of these victories. How did, how did these campaigns come about? Um, what were the kind of the key levers that needed to be pulled? And what are those victories? Tell us all about them. We, we, need, we need that hope. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, it's funny because we are mostly women, both the workers and us, a lot of us as organizers. Um, I've been saying this is not a David versus Goliath fight in our industry. It's a Davida or Daniela or Derica versus Goliath fight. That's what it is. Because we've been at this for so long and long before I came on the scene, single moms were trying to live on tips alone for 150 years. And then for the last 20 years, as I've led various organizations trying to organize these workers, I have become like a vessel that represents them. And so going up against the National Restaurant Association has mean they've put my children up on attack websites. They follow me around the country. They go after our funders and supporters to their homes. Um, they take out full page ads in Wall Street Journal condemning us. You know, I will travel somewhere and they'll show up with a digital ad truck and literally follow me around. Um, and I get death threats. That is, that's, that's been the fight. 
Um, and so the fact that the with the pandemic, you know, as hard as it's been for all of us as we've been organizing and often winning, but then uh, getting overturned or pushed back because of the power and money of the Restaurant Association, which we now came from workers, you know, now know that. Um, but with the pandemic, just, you know, there has been, it just proved over and over again, there's nothing more powerful than millions of workers themselves finally saying enough is enough. No advocate or frankly institution or anything that's as powerful as millions of workers beyond any one institution just saying enough is enough. And so we realized last year that this was the moment. This is our moment, <laughs> you know? And so we decided to go big. Last February, we announced a, a campaign we're calling 25 by 250, moving bills and ballot measures in 25 states by the United States 250th anniversary, which is 2026. You know, it's the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. And we want to write a new Declaration of Liberation for women, for women of color, for low-wage workers, um, for all of us who've been left out and marginalized and oppressed, and especially that we need to liberate ourselves from these legacies of slavery. And so we started that work in two places where we had actually won this issue and it was taken away from us democratically. The first was Michigan, where we collected 400,000 signatures back in 2018 to put this on the ballot. And the Republicans knew in the legislature in Michigan, they knew how popular this issue is, the minimum wage, raising the minimum wage. They knew how popular it is. They knew it would drive a lot of people out to vote. So they went to the press and said, we're going to make this the law. We're doing this just to keep people from voting. They told the press publicly, we promised to gut this after the election. So they took it off the ballot, made it the law, raised the wage for workers, and then gutted it after the election. And this year we collected 600,000 signatures to get it back, to get it to 15. Uh, the wage in Michigan is $3 for, for women in the restaurant industry. Uh, and courts finally ruled what Republicans had done back in 2018 unconstitutional, which means because of a Republican attempt at voter suppression, we got a 400% wage increase for women in Michigan. <laughs> um, so that was a huge first victory. And then in November, uh, we had another huge victory for workers in D.C. We organized and won. A set, we got 76% of voters in D.C. voted to raise the wage from 5 to 16.75. So these are reflections of this incredible moment of change where, you know, the fights we fought and were taken away from us now they're, they have to happen because the industry just doesn't have enough staff to survive. And so this year we're moving legislation in 11 states, including here in California, and ballot measures for 24 in another four states. So we, we are well on our way to getting 25 states, half the country. And the vision is that if we keep going in this direction, when we come back and have our next shot at a federal minimum wage, it will be much higher It'll be a living wage, and it will include everybody who's been excluded, tipped workers, workers with disabilities, youth, incarcerated workers who've been excluded from the minimum wage for so long. And that is all possible now because of the courage and power and collective, frankly, um, self-valuation and worth that women are exerting right now. And just close by saying... It is truly about women reaching a point I have found with our members during the pandemic of saying, no, I know what I'm worth. I'm worth more than this. And I refuse, I refuse to continue in this job at this wage with the way you're treating me. It's powerful. Amanda and Lisa, um, what did the women from your book tell you about um, what kinds of policy changes and fixes needed to happen? to make their lives and their families' lives, um, you know, uh, more in balance? Well, you know, much of what Sarah is saying is exactly what, what we heard from, um, from a lot of the women that we interviewed. Um, you know, another whole large population of workers um, that we interviewed were women in domestic work and um, women who do care work. And that's another area very much like restaurant workers, as Sarah was saying, that are just so underpaid and were also kept out of fair labor standards for many, many years. Um, 
and and they as well were were talking about really talking about the value of what they provide a lot of elder care workers home care workers child care workers um who you know whose whose work is paid minimum wage or close to minimum wage um you know so above all what we heard what women said to us they needed was a recognition of how valuable their work is and with that that they have to be paid more money. I mean, it, there is at a, at a certain point beyond all of the different elements of jobs and how we look at jobs, there is just this issue of what it costs to live and what it costs to raise kids. Um, and, and we have to raise, raise the wages. I, you know, I really think the other part of that, uh, what we have, what we heard from many different women was, kind of turning around and saying to the rest of the country, you know, to those who care about equity issues, who, who care about Black Lives Matter, who care about, um, who, who identify as being feminists, who have those kind of pro- progressive leanings, um, they have to become aware of this and they have to step up. They have to get engaged in it. Um, and, and I think that's the call out, Amanda, and I felt very strongly as, as we were working on this book. Yeah, say more about what everyone in this audience um, can do to better support women in low-wage work. Yeah, I think um, we've been looking at it kind of on a, you know, on a personal level, especially in terms of domestic work. Um, Look at those relationships. You know, do you employ domestic labor in your own home? What is your relationship with that person? What are the wages? Um, you know, you might even consider joining an organization. We have an um, organization called Helping Hands that we mention in the book, right, um, which actually enables you to advocate for a domestic worker that's working in your home together with them. Um, and then also, you know, if, if in your place of work, right, what are the work family policies and how do they affect people at all different levels, right? So, are the salaried professionals getting different benefit package than the people working like in the bottling factory or in the warehouse, right? And really holding yourself accountable, I think, to be aware of all the different levels, you know, irregardless of where you fall um, in terms of the spectrum. I think that's what Lisa's talking about in terms of solidarity. I mean, a lot of the women that we spoke with didn't have time to be um, you know, organizing and writing letters and and doing all the things that are necessary for activism. So I do think that women that do have the resources and the time um, to put toward those things need to be working in solidarity um, with lower income women. And that's part of our call out also. Yeah. And one, one thing that, that came up when we interviewed um some women who were affluent, um, very much identified as being progressive or as being in any case liberal and being pro-equity. Um, you know, a phrase we often heard when they described how they were juggling all the different elements in their lives, they would often say, you know, I just can't imagine what it would be like if I were a low-wage worker, or I can't imagine what it'd be like if I were a single mom. And I think one of the points of writing this book is to say we why do we need to imagine it. You know, we need to think about it. We need to be aware of that. Make that part of when we make decisions about, you know, maybe what restaurant we're going to, what are the wages that are being paid? Um, you know, when we when we look at 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 a childcare that we're picking a childcare for our children or elder care, what are the wages that people what what are the conditions of work that people have here? Um and, you know, becoming aware of that and, and having that be part of what we share with other people who are like minded. Uh, we, we're kind of taught in, in, in the society not to talk about money, you know, not to talk about what you pay, what you earn, to keep that sort of private. And we'd like to make public. We'd like to make this very public that, um, and, and kind of call up those who do have some privilege, have some affluence and identify in, in, in as, as progressive minded people, as feminists, as people who are concerned about, um, about anti-racism work, you know, if, if you identify in that way, this, this is really part of all of that. And, um, 
And so let's imagine it. Let's talk with each other about it. Let's make it, you know, a concrete example. Amanda just gave it, you know, in the workplace, if you're trying to push the glass ceiling, what's happening to the workers at the bottom, you know, at the bottom of your organization, when you get paid time off, will it, will it be for them, the women who come cater at your, at your events? Will it be for the women who were cleaning after you go home? You know, um, if it's not going to include them, then it's not good enough. And if you have some power, or you have some professional power or some affluence, you know, we're calling up, uh, we're calling them up to say, this is part this, you should be part of this too. You should be aware of it, you should pay attention and, and be part of it. I was just going to add to that, that I, in one of the interviews with an affluent mom that I did, um, she was really shocked when I said one in seven childcare and elder care workers are living in poverty and in receipt of some form of public assistance. And she was just saying, you know, childcare is wildly expensive for our family, you know, so she's just kind of seeing it on their budget as a line item. Um, So I think like holding the two together in your mind and really you know, letting that drive the conversation, you know, letting that concern all of us, right? Both how expensive childcare is, and then also what can we do about that um, in solidarity with each other, I would say. So Amanda, in the in the epilogue of the book, you talk about your friend, Michelle, and what we can learn about the true value of care work, um, which remains deeply undervalued as we've been talking about. Um, what's what was Michelle's experience and why is it instructive and an important takeaway for all of us and, and why you included it as the epilogue? It was very moving. Yeah. So um, my one of my good friends passed away while we were working on the book. Um, and sorry, I'm going to try not to make me cry during the, <laughs> the Zoom. Um and I think because of that, I just had a heightened awareness of the the care work that was going on in terms of, you know, while she was ill in her home, she was really bonded to the her home health, health aid that was taking care of her. Um, and I think we all have had this experience, right? Like this real feeling that this is the most important, probably care and relationship that we'll have in our lives. I mean, it's probably also true watching people care for our children, um, care for our our dying family members. Um, And then at the same time, kind of having this knowledge that this care worker who I also became friends with, you know, was having so many struggles in terms of working overnight in a factory at the same time. But then really, she also loved Michelle and she wanted to be there um, during these really difficult parts of her illness. So she would literally go to the factory, come race here so she could try to be with her. Um, And, you know, knowing also that when the person passes away, right, the job has ended. Um, And, you know, we saw this with many of the people that we spoke with. So, you know, developing this really intense bond um, and then really trying to, to you know, make sure that you have enough space in your work life for this intense position to take over and then it's gone, you know. So economically, that can be a struggle, too. Emotionally, I think it's a struggle, right? Um, It's a struggle on both ends. So really, I think this goes to Sarah's point about just, you know, gendered work is undervalued, right? It's, you know, taken from the private sphere of the home. It's put in the public sphere. We're not recognizing it as, you know, highly valuable in terms of money. And that just needs to change. Um, And so it, it just felt really important to me to include kind of that reflection because I feel like it's that undercurrent of care work and mothering that sort of runs through the whole book. Um, and it was just something that was happening to me personally at the time. No, thank you for sharing it. It was such a powerful moment in the book. And I think really just kind of laid bare the um, the power and the importance of those relationships and and really spoke to how we don't always see the true value in them and don't always appreciate them fully. So it was a, as I said, an incredibly powerful moment in the book. Um, we'd love to turn it over to, to questions from the audience. If, if there are any, please put them in the chat and we'll, we'll get to them straight away. Um, in the meantime, um, oh, let's see, we've got a couple here. Um, how do we improve conditions for caregivers is one of the questions. Uh, 
<clears throat> I mean, I think that some of what Amanda was just laying out, you know, speaks to that. I mean, uh, you know, almost every time I'm asked any question about how do we improve things, the first thing is we have to pay people a living. You know, people who are doing the work, the jobs of the nation, this critical care work, this, you know, this this labor that that um, that Sarah was talking about. Um, the, the jobs of the women we interviewed were valuable labor. We count on it. It is, you know, it is part of how this nation runs. We need to pay people a living. Um, we need to also, you know, for all of the women who are doing this kind of work and care work, and particularly many of them are mothers, we either have to pay them enough so they can buy the $20,000 a year in some states, child care, or we have to invest in child care. We have to invest in those systems so that that exists for every child. Uh, so, oh, wow. so really, that's essential. We're now at the point in the program where there's time for one last question. Um, and I think there was a there was a, a mention earlier of someone in the book saying that they felt like they were just being set up to fail constantly. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the circumstances were and the various kind of pain points where they felt like they were being set up to fail? I don't remember that actual quote, Lisa, do you? <laughs> I mean, I do think it's the undercurrent of, I mean, you're set up to fail as a parent. You're being criticized by teachers at your kid's school because you can't make it to the conferences. Um, you know, you're being looked down on as a parent because you might miss a doctor appointment. And then in your workplace, you're trying not to be late, right? Um, even though the reason that you're late is is likely because you're scrambling with your child. Um, you're trying to fulfill whatever crazy schedule or whatever crazy hours they're trying to put on you because you want to be viewed as a good employee, a good worker, you want to move up. Um, but Lisa, I can't remember the exact context of that quote. Yeah, I mean, absolutely all of that. And, and you know, if, in order to get some of the public assistance um, that is still available, which is very little um, and not enough, but you have to fulfill all kinds of expectations. You know, you in order to get childcare, say to go to to go to college, to get a degree, to do better, you also have to work, and you have to work full time, or you have to work half time, and you have to keep a certain grade point average, and take care of your child. And so th th it was those kinds of circumstances where women were saying, "It's just a setup. This is, you know, I'm being set up to fail." Can I add just now one very literal setup, which is. Uh, now we've, it's been revealed this week that they've been literally set up to lobby against their own wage increases, compelled to pay mm -hmm. for a lobbying firm that, for a lobbying trade association that's, you know, so they're paying $15 to ultimately then get a wage of $2. It, it's, it's, a, it's a setup. And we could use everybody's help. We have a pledge on our website onefairwage.org, where we're calling on legislators to sign a pledge that they will no longer take money from the National Restaurant Association because it's stolen money taken fraudulently from low-wage workers, particularly low-wage women. So we'd love it if you could tell every legislator you talk to, local, state, federal, sign that pledge. Don't take this money. It's, it's stolen money. So our Great and deep thanks to Lisa Dodson, Research Professor Emerita, Boston College, and co-author of Getting Me Cheap, How Low-Wage Work Traps Women and Girls in Poverty, uh, to Amanda Freeman, who is the Assistant Professor of Sociology at the University of Hartford and co-author of Getting Me Cheap, and to Saru Jayaraman, President of One Fair Wage and Director of the Food Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. If you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. Thank you and stay safe, everyone.